Jesus Christ said, I will build my church. For more than 2,000 years, he's been doing all that he promised. Today, his church remains an assembly of his saints, providing a place for worship, fellowship, and instruction. In a world that often feels isolated and alone, church remains a place to connect. It's a place to call home. We're so glad you've chosen to connect with the family of believers at Campus Church in the Crown Center at Pensacola Christian College, as together we rejoice in the Lord. Take your Bible, if you would, and join me today in Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter number 12. From 1975 to 1979, it is likely that over two million people were ruthlessly murdered in a genocide that took place in Cambodia. We now refer to this, this genocide and the place where it happened as the killing fields. It was back in 2008 when I had the opportunity to join a team on a special trip to Cambodia where we did some truly wonderful work, opportunities to go back into unreached areas and help those who are on the ground in Cambodia to advance the gospel. And while there, we had opportunity to, to walk the trails and the paths of what is commonly referred to as the killing fields. In one of those that we toured, we walked around on those grounds, and, and as you're walking the trails, there are not in just some random fashion, but just strewn throughout the trails that you're walking upon, there are on the trails and on either sides the, the remains of those people whose lives were taken. Their bones are literally coming out of the pathways that you're walking upon. There are fragments of clothes and there are piles of clothes that are still laying in different places that belonged to those whose lives were just senselessly taken. A Pol Pot was the, the leader, the president, the, the one in charge and the one responsible from the head down regarding the taking of these lives. There is a a strange memorial set up in the middle of the one that we toured, and there the human skulls are just stacked layer upon layer upon layer as a memorial tribute to those whose lives were lost. The thing that you can't help but think of, ponder when you are exposed to such human brutality is how can another human come to the place where they would participate in such atrocity? How can a person get themselves to the place where this is as normal as anything else? The Bible speaks about the adulteress in the book of Proverbs, and it says that she commits this wickedness, and she's literally marching someone to the very steps of hell. And after she's committed this wickedness, she can have a meal and wipe her mouth as if this is no different than having a good meal. And you wonder, how can a person engage in such human deprivations and, and pillow their head at night or laugh with their own children or, or have a, a, a conversation with their wife about how was your day. So how do we get ourselves to this place where we can perform and do those things that seem unthinkable and I suspect that the answer is not far away from, well, we do it just moment by moment. Little by little. It is not this, this all of a sudden realization that I can do this. It just happens in, in such incremental fashion that all of a sudden we find ourselves in a place that we never imagined we could have been. So how did we get there? Well, there is something that is driving the external act and it is the internal thinking. S something was introduced to my mind. 
I was moved just a little. The needle started to inch towards something that I thought impossible, and yet here we are doing something that we just could have never imagined. You say, Pastor, what does that have to do with the text that is before us? And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What, does, what do the killing fields in Cambodia have to do with be not conformed, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind? Because whatever it is that we do, it didn't begin externally, it began in your mind. There is a converse application, there is something that is opposite to the killing fields, and that is living the life of Jesus Christ. One of the dangers of man's religion is that oftentimes it starts on the outside, trying to in some way, shape, or form get to the inside, but it doesn't work that way. In fact, it's never the way that Jesus gave us his pattern for Christian living. What he helps us understand is let this mind, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this thinking start with you, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. And then with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. A person is first saved, that happens internally. And then a step of obedience is baptism. That's some external expression of the internal decision of following Jesus Christ. Even good Christians, followers of Jesus, can so subtly be taken in with this external form of righteousness, but then we deny the power thereof. What Paul's about to address is something that does happen incrementally. It's not just one day I was this and the next day I was that. It is this opportunity to grow into the likeness of Jesus Christ. No one that's ever committed these incredible atrocities against humanity, such as happened in the 70s in Cambodia, no one wakes up doing this. It is this gradual introduction to that which they never dreamed possible, but has become them. And then again, on that converse side, there is something about Christianity that is also telling. Like, Lord, I don't know if I'm ever going to get to where I need to be in my Christian walk. I seem so far away. I continually struggle with, I don't know if I can ever be like Jesus. And the Apostle Paul lays out for us a navigable pathway to transformed living. Do you know a metamorphosis took place in you, Christian, when you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? You became something entirely new. And what the Apostle Paul is getting at is not only are you a new person, here's how to live like a new person. So your Bibles are open to Romans chapter 12. Today we continue on the second part of a message that we began that we are titling Conformed or Transformed. Conformed or Transformed. We're in Romans chapter 12. The first thing that we're going to look at, just by way of review, is this problematic conformity. This problematic conformity. Again, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 12, the first part of verse number two, and be not conformed to this world. This world, we won't spend much time, but this system that is overseen by the enemy of God. This, this, this plan, this blueprint for life that is diametrically opposed to the plans and the will of God. Paul expresses this problematic conformity knowing that believers could allow something to happen to them that will reduce them to a life that God never intended them to live. L- listen, he's, he's saying, child of God, this is not the life you want This is not the life God intended, and you don't have to live it. So he begins to unpack for us, okay, well, how do I live the life God intended me to live? Remember the word conformed. It's the word that we get schematic from. 
blueprint, the plan, the schemes of our enemy. So this is not the plan, this is not the blueprint of Almighty God. Satan, our real enemy, is the God of this world system that functions in rebellion against God. Paul is putting us on guard. You say, well, why why is he doing this? Well, he tells us in 2 Corinthians 2.11, lest Satan should get an advantage of us. For we are not ignorant of his devices. Listen, we're not ignorant of the fact that he does have a plan. In a church setting just like this, you'll oftentimes hear people speak of the will of God. True, he has one, but so does his enemy. And Paul's saying, listen, don't give the enemy a strategic advantage over you. We're not ignorant of the fact that he has his own set of blueprints that are not the same as God's. So before we move on, let's take just a moment and consider one of the devices that he's using today as his blueprint, his scheme. And it has to do with the human body. Remember what Paul has just covered in Romans chapter 12, verse number one. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your, what's, I know, I know it's silly and sometimes like it, it is not intended to be childish, but let's say the next word together. I'll get to it and then I'll pause just briefly and let's say it together. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies. Your bodies, a living sacrifice. Does God have a will for your body? And the answer is yes, he does. Does he have intentions for the human body? Well, clearly he does. And he's saying, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. Listen, he's saying, this is your reasonable service. And then he goes on, be not conformed to this world. Do you know, there is quite a theology regarding the human body. Now, someday we're gonna get a new one. Thank the Lord for that a new body that, that, that now embodies everything that he designed us to do will be complete. But you know, the human body that God's blessed you with right now is not unimportant. In fact, when we pass from death to life and we say, God, I belong to you, and we present our bodies, we're actually just giving back to him that which already belongs to him. Paul says elsewhere, didn't you know what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you. You're not your own. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. They belong to him. So let's ask the question today, does the world and our enemy, specifically Satan, does he have a blueprint for the human body? Like what you should do with your body that is designed by God specifically to to fulfill a role and thereby actually become a reflection of the God who made us. The confusion that's being systematically perpetuated today regarding the human body is staggering. We're told that a person's body can identify as anything you desire, but this runs contrary to the biblical narrative that God created them male and female and that gender is assigned at conception. But our enemy today has put forth a false narrative, a scheme that runs contrary to creation, and a blueprint that is constructing a worldview that can't support itself. For example, we've denied the reality of biological gender. We've said that your body can actually be anything that you desire. This runs contrary to any science, and it certainly runs contrary to the thinking that's presented throughout the pages of Scripture. We've taken something that should be easily recognizable, such as boys and girls sports, and made it a mockery and a public joke. The problem is no one is laughing. We've destroyed the most basic aspect of privacy in public settings for women. We've abandoned one of the most basic parts of language, which is the pronoun, and turned entire populations upside down. And we've deprived parents the custody of their children if they don't comply with this way of thinking. All of this and so much more is connected to the human body. We start to understand how important it is that we're 
processing what the Apostle Paul is saying. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. And don't be conformed to the thinking, the schematic, the blueprints of the world, but instead be transformed, made into something completely new. How? By the renewing of your mind. It's why we talk about presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice. And we should remember that when we offer to God our bodies, we are offering him our all. And whatever God has, he uses perfectly. Retaining possession of ourselves will never result in a more desirable conclusion. Let me say that again. Retaining possession of ourselves never results in a more desirable conclusion. Well, I just don't know that I want to present my body to God. Well, you're making a lesser decision. Whatever it is that we offer to God, God alone has the the, the ability, the power to do something better with what we offer to him than were we to keep it or retain it for ourselves. So how can I keep myself from being squeezed into the world's mold through this problematic conformity, it is going to take what we would call a powerful change. A powerful change. Okay, so we understand a problematic conformity. Let's look at this powerful change. The Bible says again, Romans chapter 12, the second part now, or into verse number two, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Okay, note the contrast that's presented here. He says, not conformed, but instead transformed. The Greek verb that's used here, metamorpho, metamorphosis is the word that we get from this Greek word. This means like, wow, this is a radical change, something that was one thing, and now it is metamorphosized. It is changed into another. Matthew uses the word in in his gospel, Matthew uses the word when he's describing the transfiguration of Christ. Do you remember when Jesus took the three, the inner circle, Peter, James, John, he takes them up into a mountain apart. There he's going to be transfigured in front of them. The Bible says, and verse uh, Matthew 17, two, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. Here, Paul, in our text, is not talking about being conformed. He's not even talking about being reformed. He's talking about being transformed by a higher power. How does this happen? How how can this powerful transformation even begin? How does it take place? Well, he tells us that too. He says, by the renewing of your mind. The word renewing that's used here, it's a compound word. It comes from ana kainos, ana kainos, ana. It's the word again, kainos, new. So he's saying, and again, it's new. And again, it's new. And again, and again, and again. It is this ongoing process of mental renewal that has some power to now not only change my thinking, but change my living, literally changing my life. The renewing of our mind. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, the inward man is, here's our word again, the inward man is renewed. How? Day by day by day by day. Every day. We're faced with a continual assault by the enemy. And the currencies of the day are the lies and the depravity and the self-centeredness of mankind. It's a world where we're called upon not only to allow, but to actually celebrate depravity. And any failure to do so is met with the angry and aggressive shouts of intolerance. It's a world where a murderer is the victim. And the real victim is the one who we're told probably deserved all that he had coming. Obviously, this is not the pattern left for us in the pages of Scripture. The Bible helps us understand this as well. Notice in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul writing the church at Ephesus, verse number 20. Beginning in verse 20, he says this. 
but ye have not so learned Christ. Now pause for just a moment. Let that little phrase from this passage resonate. But ye have not so learned Christ. Okay, hey, hey, listen. This thinking, this is inconsistent with what you know about Jesus Christ. And then he goes on, he says, if so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and here's our word again, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness, This is why our knowledge must be continually renewed in the image of the one who created us. My thinking has to constantly be challenged to align with his. Okay, my thinking can constantly veer off into those things that are inconsistent with Jesus. Therefore, I have to keep bringing it back over and over and over again to the original, the source, the great beginning. And if I don't keep coming back to that, who knows where my mind will lead me? Do you know what, do you know what Scripture is? Scripture is the great lane assist technology. Do you know what happens to our thinking? Do you know what starts to happen to where we veer off? We start to go in places that might seem natural to us, might seem normal to us. In fact, we have other people who agree with us and and now we've come together and and we're all thinking the same thing and we're all actually veering off the, the, the way of thinking that was established from the one who created the world. So, so what do I do if I want my thinking renewed? I have to keep going back to the source. Keep going back to the original. Keep going back to the one who says, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him, have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation. The old man, it's corrupt according to the deceitful us. Renewed in the spirit of your mind. Put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true. He's just saying, hey, come on, keep coming back to the original. It's why our knowledge must be continually renewed in the image of the one who created us. Colossians 3.10 gives us the same idea. And if put on the new man, that's really the metamorphosis of salvation. And then he says, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Ah, renewed, again, I'm restored to right thinking. Essentially, this continual renewal is restoring us back to a more accurate reflection of the one whose image we were created to reflect. Created. Okay, remember, we're all image bearers. That's why all of mankind, I don't care who it is, and I don't care how different they are from your thinking, all mankind are created as those who bear the image of Almighty God. Sometimes that is a more distorted image. That's why we have to have this mental renewal, the renewing of our minds, taking us back to the image of the one that is instilled in all of mankind. The tense of the word renewing, it means that this is a continual, ongoing change. This is something happening to us, and in some slow internal change, it begins to result in an external change. Remember, the external was never intended to bring about internal change, but the other way around, the internal brings the external. So, an important question. How's this going to be happening in my life? Okay, so I get it. I get it, Pastor. You're saying that we have to have this continual renewal. We have to keep coming back to the mind of Christ. So, so, okay, so how does that happen? What does that look like? It happens by means of our continual looking into that which is perfect. And that is the timeless truths of the Word of God. Are you reading the Word of God? Campus Church, 
We put a lot of things in front of our eyes on a daily basis. We scroll through images and through content that captivates our attention. And oftentimes, slowly, incrementally, I mean, I mean, scroll by scroll, just a little flick, just a little touch, and something is being presented to us that is gradually, yet assuredly, influencing my thinking. What is it on a daily basis, campus church, that we are continually putting in front of us that is intended to renew our minds back to our original created image? The Bible has the principle of sowing and reaping scattered all throughout it. We see it every place we look. Job 4, 8, they that plow iniquity and sow in wickedness reap the same. Okay, so I, if I plant this, sow this, I'm going to reap this. Proverbs 1, they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own desires. Okay, f- okay this is the way, and now I'm going res- to reap the same. Proverbs eleven eighteen. 18, to him that soweth righteousness shall be a sure reward. That makes sense. Hosea 8, 7, for they have sown the wind, they shall reap the whirlwind, sowing and reaping. Hosea 10, 12, sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy. We get it. It's why Paul, writing to the church at Colossae, said, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Okay, the word of God, let it, the word dwell there, it means to be at home with. To be at home with. Like, oh yeah, I know this. There are those in this room that just get it. I know my home, the place that that I dwell, I know it. You can walk the hallways. You can flip the switch in the dark. You know exactly where you're going and how to get there. You know the nooks and crannies, the little parts of the home, the place where you dwell. And that's what he says. That's supposed to be our normal, common experience with the Word of God. Like, I get it. I I know where to look for this, and and I I, I know what he's trying to say, and I'm starting to understand more and more the truths that are are exposed in, in the pages of the Word of God. He says we're to let the word dwell in us richly. That means in abundance and in wisdom. Yet we often give such little attention to the word of God. Some people ask, you know, how should I read the word of God? And and I would answer with no intention to be cute, but just by starting. How should I read the word? I don't know how to start. Just start reading. Say, well, well, where do I begin? What's of interest to you? Is there a place you can look at in the pages of the Word of God where where a person would say, oh, no, 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 don't look there. Listen, open its pages and begin. Do you have some interest, a place where you'd like to start? Would you like to start learning about the life of Jesus? Would you like to start finding out about the riches of His grace? Would you like practical wisdom for daily living? Would you like to understand more about origins? No matter what your desire, there's going to be a place found in the pages of Scripture where you can open it and begin to have your mind renewed. Some more metamorphosis begins to take place where I am changed from this into this, and it is a dramatic change. How are we to approach the Word of God? Well, like we just said, first of all, read it. You can't be changed by a word you never read. You can't be changed by a word you never read. It's just like you can't be nourished. You can't grow from nourishment that you've never personally received. To be influenced or inspired by truth is good, but not the same as having truth infused and ingested into the very fiber of your being. You will never live the life of Christ that you do not know. Well, I want to live the life of Christ. Okay, do you know him? We find him in the pages of his word. The only way to truly know him is to read his life story to become so intimately familiar with him that you begin to imitate his life, his actions, his thinking. This leads us to what do we do next? Okay, so read it. And then what? Reflect on it. Just start thinking about it. Like, what is it that he's saying? Let me ponder that. What bearing does that have in my life today? 
as we reflect on his word, we begin to actually do the same thing. We begin to reflect the word. The metamorphosis is starting. The change is occurring. Oh, I'm reflecting. I'm pondering the word of God. Guess what? Now you begin to reflect the word of God. It's similar to what happened to Moses. Do you remember when Moses went up up into the mountain and he's going to meet with God and he comes down. And when he comes down from the mountain, there is something noticeably different about him. He is reflecting the one whose presence he's been in. The the writer in the book of of 2 Corinthians, Paul says, listen, let's hearken back to this. Let's use this illustratively. He says, but we all with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. He says, hey, listen, you're going to look in the mirror and you're going to start to see Jesus. How does that happen? It happens when we reflect on his word, we begin to reflect the living word. Yeah, read it, reflect it, regard it, regard it. You say, what do you mean by that? Isaiah 6, says, but to this man will I look. God saying, hey, this is the person that's gonna get my attention. Even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembleth at my word. Ooh. Do you know what he's talking about? He's talking about the person that holds in high regard the word of God. So the word says, don't do this. Okay, it's done. The word says, I should be doing this. Absolutely. If the word says it, then why wouldn't I do it? What it means is I don't try to argue with or rationalize away the teachings of the word of God. I come before it and I say, okay, what's the word saying? All right, I hold that in the highest regard. That now is something that I have to hold on to because I hold in high regard the word of God. What do we do? We read it, we reflect on it, we regard it, and then lastly, repeat it. Repeat it. It's the idea of memorizing it, putting it to ready use, making it your first answer to the questions of life. Repeat it. Okay, so what should I do about this? Oh, hey, hey, here's some scripture that helps me understand how to navigate through this challenging circumstance. Repeat it. You know, all of this has to do with a powerful change that occurs in the life of a believer. Just to wrap this all up, to kind of tie a bow on the thinking that the apostle has been giving us, we see this problematic conformity. We see a powerful change. But do you know what he does? He says, "Let, let me show you as he says. He's saying, let me show you the proven conclusion. This is something that is undeniably true. It is a proven conclusion. And here's how he says it. He says that ye may, there's the word, that ye may prove. Not just like, oh, hey, that looks reasonable. Or that's a good way for life. Or, or hey, here's one option. He says, no, 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 no. That ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The person who's been transformed and is being conformed by the renewing of their mind begins to prove something to both himself and to a watching world. He is proving what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Prove. It just means, all right, put it under the spotlight. Let's scrutinize this. Let's tear this apart. Let's break this down. Let's see what's this made of. He says, go ahead. I mean this, there are people in this room today with honest questions that are connected to your faith. You have honest questions about Christianity. You have honest questions about what you might even call your faith. This is my faith, but I have questions about this. Do you know what he's saying? He's saying, all right, let's break it down, dive in. Do you know as believers and sometimes as mature believers that are are tasked with the responsibility of leading others, sometimes we too soon shut a question down because we don't know fully the answer. It's not a healthy thing. Typically, we don't move beyond our questions. I have a question like, okay, I've I've got this question and, and I can't seem to get past. Do you know what the Bible invites us to do? He says, go ahead and scrutinize, dig in. Come on, let's, let's, let's tear this apart and see where we land. Do you know how many people have tried to dive into the word of God to tear it apart only to find that is the word of God? So let's dig in. 
Let's dive in and see. Okay, I have these questions. Does the Bible really have answers? And the, and the answer to that question is absolutely. So he says that we may prove, recognize as genuine. And then he says good. That, that word just means pleasant, joyful. We, we might even use the word today, happy. That you may prove, what is that good and acceptable? That means well-pleasing. Like, oh, who wouldn't like this? That you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect. That word means complete, mature. Like, whoa, wow, there's some, there's some depth and, and some growing, some maturity that is connected with. It's not lacking anything. Who wouldn't want to make this kind of living sacrifice? To gain what can be found through no other means. We, we might even ask, is it really a sacrifice if we get to prove What is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? Is it really a sacrifice? Good question. I would also offer, if you're going around unhappy with God, then like we saw in Ephesians 4.20, ye have not so learned Christ. If we're going around unhappy with God, we have learned some other Jesus, but not the Jesus of the Bible. When a person comes and they say, okay, God, you can have me. My body, this is all of me. I'm giving you this as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God. I know this is, this is reasonable service. And Lord, I don't want to be conformed to this world, but I want to be transformed by the renewing of my mind so that I might be this living testimony to prove, to, to, to look with, with, the, with the greatest magnifying glass possible, to scrutinize, to break this thing down, that I may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Who wouldn't want to make that kind of offering? And if you're not happy with God, you have not so learned Christ This is not the reality of the transformed life. To that person, I would offer again the words of Scripture, examine yourselves. Whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Christ Jesus is in you? Except ye be reprobates. That means illegitimate, unproved, not the reality of the thing. Every day, everywhere we go, Christians are called to be the living proof for anyone to scrutinize, to examine and see if there's something genuine, legitimate, proven to be real regarding our faith. We are his plan that the world is invited to scrutinize. For years with teenagers, I presented a a simple illustration I would usually call two people up and I'd say, okay, you're going to represent for us the will of God. And and then we would kind of ooh and ah. I'd say, this is the will of God. Whenever I point to them, we'll just kind of go, ooh, the will of God, very serious. And then another person, and they would represent happiness. And whenever I point to them, just happiness and ha. The will of God and happiness. And here you are left to decide. I know I'm supposed to do the will of God. And I'd point and, ooh. I know I I need to do the, the unthinkable. I need to deny myself and do the will of God. But I want to be happy. I just want to enjoy my life. I want to do those things that are fun and enjoyable. And I just want to, I just want to be happy. And ha. But alas, the will of God. Ooh. And, and what, a, what a challenge this is. And what a false representation of the reality of the Christian life. Shame on us, Christians, if this is how we present Christianity. Are there hardships in Christianity? Certainly. But the hardships, the sufferings are not to be compared to the joy which is to come for the person who is walking with their Savior. Are you buying into this this false presentation of Christianity? Well, if I serve God, 
no more happiness for me. I just have to do the will of God or I'm going to be happy. It's one of the two. I submit to you that you will never find true happiness until you first choose the will of God. And you know what he's saying to us? He's saying, listen, prove it. That ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Pastor, how can this transformation take place in my life? <laughs> it's found all throughout the pages of God's holy word. Look into it and you'll begin to see its likeness in you. We're glad you joined us for Rejoice in the Lord as we've discovered answers to life's questions from God's Word. Messages are also available on iTunes when you search Rejoice TV or find us on YouTube by searching Rejoice in the Lord. Your financial support is vital to keep Rejoice on the air. Your tax-deductible gift enables this viewer-supported ministry to spread the gospel around the world. Encouraging Christians and reaching people for Jesus. This is Rejoice in the Lord.